Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Okay, members, you're all welcome to a meeting of the uh, Justice Committee. If members can do the needful with any electronic uh, devices at this stage, if there's any uh, matters of business whereby there is an interest uh, on today's agenda, now is the time to declare it. If not, then we will proceed. Um, there's no apologies. We have uh, Doug Beatty, Gemma Dolan and Sinead Bradley all joining us via the Starley facility. And if I can just ask the clerk to advise of any members having delegated their votes under the appropriate standing order. Certainly, um, Gemma Dolan has delegated her vote under standing order 1156 to the Deputy Chairperson Linda Dillon in the event that the Starleaf connection is lost. Okay. Thank you. Item 2 on the agenda then is the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 1st and the 3rd of December. Pages 5 to 8 of your meeting pack are the minutes of the meeting that were held on the 1st of December and then pages 9 to 14 of the meeting pack for the draft minutes of the 3rd of December. And if members are content that they're a true ref reflection of proceedings of the meeting held on the 1st of December, then I can sign them accordingly if members are agreed. Agreed. And if members are content that the minutes are a true reflection of proceedings on the 3rd of mm. December as well. Members agreed? Agreed. agreed. Okay, so matters arising. There's three items just in terms of uh, matters arising. Item one, there was a letter from the First Minister and Deputy First Minister regarding the health protection regulations. Uh, they wrote to the committee on the 7th of December in relation to the Minister for Justice leading the Assembly debate on the health protection regulations on Tuesday, a letter of which was circulated to members on Monday, and that's on pages 16 and 17 of the meeting pack. Um, correspondence arrived before the letter from the committee had been sent. The committee letter, which reflects the committee position as agreed at last Thursday's meeting, has uh, now subsequently issued to the First and Deputy First um, Minister. So if members are content, we'll also just send a copy of the committee letter to the Minister of Health and the Minister of Justice, given that they were copied into the correspondence from FMDF. Members agreed? Agreed. Item 2 is the Committee Forward Work Programme, um, pages 18 to 16. The Forward Work Programme has been updated to reflect the deferral of two work items as requested by the Department of Justice. The Department has also provided an update on the position regarding those items of business that had indicated it intended to bring to the Committee between September and December. That have not been scheduled. Um, so members, all members have indicated their agreement to postpone the committee meeting, and um, this is the the one that was planned for next Tuesday. And yeah. um, so members were contacted yesterday, and all members have came back to say that they're content uh, to postpone that meeting that was scheduled for next Tuesday, at which the minister was due to attend to discuss justice issues, given that plenary business on that day. Um, which obviously is the further consideration stage of the domestic abuse bill will now be taking place uh, and there is no planned break in proceedings uh, for next Tuesday um, that would facilitate that meeting if proceedings were to continue on longer than has been indicated on the timesheet. So um, we will reschedule that as early as possible for a suitable date in, in January. Um, a draft forward work programme for January 2021 will be considered then at next week's meeting. <coughs> Finally, in this section, a letter has been received from the Minister of Justice uh, this morning indicating that she will be resisting the committee amendment that was brought forward for further consideration stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. Uh, copies of the letter have been provided uh, in a hard copy for members information, so I'm not sure if all members had an opportunity just to, to take a look at that. Um, I suppose can I first of all just welcome that this will be confirmation that uh, further consideration stage will now be moved. Um, obviously the Minister has articulated her position in respect to the committee amendment, but um, nevertheless the democratic process uh, will, will obviously work its way through the, the various amendments um, next Tuesday, but what's important is that the further consideration stage is being moved, and I welcome uh, that. Okay, members. Item four, then, is the substantive part of today's meeting, um, the multi-agency briefing on organised crime in Northern Ireland, and officials from the National Crime Agency, Revenue and Customs, the Police Service, and the Department of Justice 
are attending the meeting today to provide a briefing on organised crime in Northern Ireland. The relevant papers are at pages 28 through to 169 of the meeting pack and include a briefing paper from the Department and the most recent Organised Crime Task Force Annual Report and Threat Assessment. So hopefully we have quite a number um, of the officials then that are joining through the Starley facility. Um, okay, great. Yes, we, we have you coming through. So can I formally welcome uh, Julie Harrison, Director of the Safer Communities from the Department of Justice, uh, Barbara Gray, the Assistant Chief Constable, uh, from the Police Service of Northern Ireland, uh, Craig Naylor, Deputy Director of Investigations North National Crime Agency, and Steve Tracy, Assistant Director of Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, to the meeting. Uh, you're all very welcome. I uh, appreciate you taking the time to engage with the, the Justice Committee. As normal, the session will be recorded um, by Hansard, and a transcript of proceedings will then be published on the Committee webpage. So at this stage, I'm going to hand over to yourselves. I'm not sure who's going to make um, remarks or what, Julie. So Julie, thank you. I will let you kick off proceedings from your end. And once um, you've had an opportunity to provide your briefing, then members will pick up some questions at that stage. So thank you, Julie. Thank you, Chair. Um, we're very grateful for the chance to, to brief you today on the threat, risk and harm from organised crime. Um, and to outline the role of partners in, in working together to tackle it. Um, as you said, very grateful to colleagues, Barbara, Stephen, Craig, um, for joining us. Craig gets particular um, merit for flying in from Edinburgh to join us today, so thank you very much for that. Um, as key law enforcement partners, they'll be able to provide you with more detail um, on issues and challenges faced in tackling organised crime, both from individual organisational perspectives and, and collectively. Um, you'll recall that the committee received a briefing from colleagues in Protection and Organised Crime Division recently um, on the draft organised crime strategy, um, and that obviously contains strategic aims and objectives for working together to address the threat, risk and harm from organised crime. Um, and the plan is that that strategy will run from April 21 to March 2024. More recently, um, you had an update on progress in relation to the tackling paramilitary activity, criminality and organised crime programme, and obviously there are clear links between organised crime and paramilitarism, and no doubt we'll end up um, talking about that today. Um, I know the committee has asked for further update on the tackling paramilitarism programme, and we um, will be keen to come back to you once we have a, a clearer position on funding for that. In, in terms of this session, um, not least because partners are here, we thought it might be helpful to set up, I can set up the background to the organised crime task force, and then colleagues will weigh in on the more operational issues. So some of you are familiar, OCTF was established in 2000 um, to help and secure a safe, just and prosperous society by confronting organised crime very much through a multi-agency and a partnership approach. It brings together a number of relevant organisations, including the three represented here today, to provide a strategic and I think importantly a, a coordinated approach to tackling organised crime. It's probably worth emphasising that the OCTF is not in itself operational in nature but rather it provides a space for information and expertise to be shared. And as a strategic partnership, it supports the development of operational collaboration, usually based around crime types. It also has a vital communications role um, in informing the public um, and businesses, particularly around emerging threats and about the steps that people can take um, to protect themselves and their businesses from the harm of organized crime. You've had the briefing paper, and as it indicates, um, organised crime is, of course, an issue that affects all societies um, and costs economies billions of pounds um, every year. It can also be defined as, as planned and coordinated activity conducted by people working together on a continuing basis. Um, motivation is usually, although not always, financial gain. While, of course, um, numbers fluctuate, um, and I'm sure ACC Gray will say more about this, there are in the region of 80 organised crime groups currently being monitored by PSNI, almost a third of whom are involved in more than one crime type, um, and similarly, um, about a third are linked to, to paramilitary organisations. The current threat assessment you've had, um, and it's set out in the, in the annual report for 1920, but I suppose just to draw out some of the key threats, um, drug crime remains um, a serious concern, so substance misuse causes a wide range of harm to individuals, to families and, of course, to communities. Um, it includes crimes committed to fuel drug dependence, organised criminality, violence, including so-called paramilitary-style attacks, and the kind of exploitation 
that goes hand in hand with production and supply. Cybercrime, so the use of technology to facilitate criminal activity remains a prominent feature of crimes reported in Northern Ireland. And recent cyber attacks highlight the technical ability and actually the ruthless nature um, of cyber criminals. Modern slavery and human trafficking as well. Um, it's difficult to understand or quantify the true scale of this terrible crime um, in Northern Ireland. The main driver is, of course, the pursuit of profit by coercing victims to provide a service. The number of offences and the number of potential victims identified through the national referral mechanism increased last year. Um, there's the detail of that in, in the threat assessment. But while an increase can be interpreted as an increase in the problem, it can also sometimes be reflective of better reporting and better understanding and awareness. You have a copy of the annual report and the threat assessment, which has a lot of the detail on that. That report also sets out some of the response to the threat, and I imagine that's a lot of what we'll talk about today. Um, just as crime gangs, um, whether they're locally based um, or internationally based, evolve and adapt to changing technologies and social and political landscape, partners are striving to keep pace or preferably to stay ahead of those new and emerging threats. Colleagues here today will no doubt wish to elaborate further on the international nature of organised criminality and the arrangements in place for tackling that, as as well as kind of particular responsiveness to excuse me particular responsiveness to recent issues such as COVID um, and any new threats that emerge in relation to EU exit. I suppose in that context, it would be important to stress that effective cross-border cooperation is increasingly relevant. And I'm sure Barbara will go into more detail on that in relation to the Joint Agency Task Force, which provides a recognised forum for supporting and enhancing operational activity across the border. Similarly, um, Steve and Craig can cover NCA and HMRC effort to disrupt serious and organised crime before it reaches Northern Ireland. Um, I think, Chair, that's as far as I would take it. I'm sure you'll be keen um, to ask colleagues of questions and we're more than happy to take those. Okay. Thank you, Julie. So, if you're happy, we'll just move into questions, if that's okay. Um, I suppose in the, the, the first question I wanted to ask, obviously from 2015, the NCA have had their powers, and, and maybe Barbara w w wants to pick up on this, and obviously the NCA as well, but in terms of how that relationship has developed and evolved over that period of time, um, Barbara, do you want to comment as the, the kind of lead whenever it comes to directing these sort of operations? How have the NCA been able to complement the work of the PSNI to effectively um, tackle organised crime? Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I believe the relationship with the NCA has evolved and uh, developed um, really well uh, since 2015. I have had um, personal experience in the last uh, two years, uh, just over two years, and even through that time I can see how um, our effectiveness uh, grows and grows. Um, I think, um, as members will know, that uh, the NCA and colleagues from HMRC are embedded in the Paramilitary Crime Task Force. But the support that we get from the NCA uh, within Northern Ireland and as a police service goes far and beyond just the work of the Paramilitary Crime Task Force. Um, there the, is a very significant role as regards to the modern slavery, human trafficking, um, as regards the interventions at uh, sort of a higher end, um, interventions that can take place before forms of criminality can actually reach the shores of Northern Ireland as well. Um, I think from a strategic perspective, um, within the last two to three years, again, um, I have uh, represented, or at least at the Assistant Chief Constable uh, level, has been represented at the Strategic Task and Coordination Group with the NCA um, for a period of time, and that's with every other police service across the United Kingdom, um, and other agencies attend that as well. And I think that's an extremely beneficial piece that plays in a lot around the analytical products that we can be supported by, um, and then how that can translate into our own um, our own operational uh, strategies and delivery within Northern Ireland. Craig, do you want to, to just comment then in terms of how the organisation has been embedding over those five years and it's, it's working with the PSNI? 
Thank you, Chair. Yeah, very happy to do so. Um, I will caveat it, though. I've only been with the agency for 18 months uh, and came into this last August. Um, the relationship with PSNI and with other partners in Northern Ireland is very good. Uh, we are reliant on each other to deliver success. Um, so much so that we are currently doing joint training with Barbara's teams around surveillance to show that we can both operate together effectively, uh, but also to make sure that we are all match fit and understand how each other's tactics works. So improving that capability is something that we're very keen on doing. Um, going back, and I've had to take a bit of a history lesson on what has happened since 2015, um, but the NCA um, capability in Northern Ireland was very much focused on some other investigations that I won't want to go into because of the operational nature of them here, um, but they were very much focused on the wider uh, national and international threat and less so on the shores of Northern Ireland. In the last two years, we've refocused our efforts um, to do a number of things, to, to work more effectively with Barbara's teams, but to, to try and understand where the threat is coming towards Northern Ireland uh, and tackle it ahead of getting it onto the shores here. So all of our efforts that are led from the Belfast office are focused on near Europe, are focused on uh, organised immigration crime, drug smuggling, and so on and so forth. And often the intervention takes place in the southeast of England, or indeed on the road to Holyhead uh, to get a ferry into the south of Ireland. So what we're trying to do is to make sure that the application of our tactics are done at the most appropriate time to take the maximum effort in, in reality to stop crime coming to Northern Ireland. And that's really our focus. So in, in terms of the, the work of trying to disrupt these crime gangs, I know one of the issues that have been raised in the past, that previously when we had our own assets recovery agency, for example, it was more localised, focused on localised crime, and the NCA took a, a greater interest in the international type of crime. Uh, and I just would value some commentary as to whether or not uh, those feelings that smaller crimes are slipping through the net because of the national focus of the crime agency um, compared to what the assets recovery agency may have been able to to pick up and to that effect I note from the report it speaks of 2.2 million pound of confiscation orders of assets now that and maybe I'm wrong that to me seems small in comparison to the kind of finances that are generated by this sort of criminal activity and if you could comment on that then as well so i don't mind if if that's barbara and craig um whoever wishes to pick that up well i think um, if you don't mind chair if i um, kick off on that one um please uh, as from my point of view as regards uh, our capability for financial investigation we, we do benefit from um, NCA and HMRC uh, financial investigators. Um, we do have our own economic crime unit within the Police Service of Northern Ireland as well. Um, the input certainly uh, from NCA and HMRC focuses um, not exclusively, but a lot on the paramilitary, uh, with the paramilitary crime task force. Um, and certainly that is where they're the, would have been debate previously about the, the threshold, because the threshold would um, definitely within Northern Ireland be lower than what uh, would have would have um, instigated some of the investigations, certainly uh, nationally. I think that's fair to say. Craig. Yeah, uh, no, I have to pick this up, Barbara. You know, one of the things that's been um, libelled against the NCA is that we're only focused on those that are bringing international money into London. Um, that's very definitely not the case and the work of the civil recovery team actually based in Belfast as part of the Paramilitary Crime Task Force I think is an exemplar of tackling harm in communities. The key issue for me is actually to understand who is it that's profiting from the crime in the community and how do we tackle them most effectively whether that's through uh, Steve and the tax, pur uh, tax purposes that uh, they can bring to the debate or the criminal aspect of it or the civil recovery aspect. As an organisation, we are investing uh, in people uh, ever more to do financial investigation and financial intelligence collection work, as we see that as a, a, a direct route to tackling the criminality. In Northern Ireland, we are less concerned about uh, the value in terms of pounds. We're more concerned about the harm it has in communities. And I think the, the bit for us is if we could see 
changes to legislation in line with uh, the illicit finance legislation in England and Wales, then that will give us greater opportunity and, and allow us to move that forward very, very much more quickly than we currently can. Could I add to that, Chair, if you don't mind? Yes, Steve, because I, I, I didn't want to, to make you feel like you were being neglected, so I'm happy for you to come in. <laughs> and if you want to, in addition to that, I was going to ask you about um, the VAT dodging that takes place, particularly when it comes to fuel laundering and, and what is being done. And I know from the marker, uh, obviously went into fuel, that may have had a positive impact. But if you want to just pick up that issue as well, Steve, thank you. Of course, thank you. Um, just to reiterate, I think some of what um, Craig has been saying, I think the real benefits of the Parity Crime Task Force and the three agencies working so closely together and have it embedded staff within that has really come to the fore. Um, and similarly to Craig, um, we uh, some of the investigations that, that my team within PCTF have led on uh, huge excise uh, investigations. Aside from those, um, which is a fairly natural lead, I think, and something that everybody can understand that PCTF would get involved in, we also drop our de minimis limits actually to look at some of the tax credit cases so that the family members actually and some of the people that are let's say having some control over uh, the community are also um, uh, targeted as part of these uh, investigations. So um, those, and I think those actually have as much impact as some of the larger figures that we see in the press um, trumpeted, I think, you know, through, through big investigations, they have more community impact. Um, so, and, but I think the, the ability of the three agencies to work alongside each other has opened up, I think, what is actually available to us through shared financial investigation and, and best use of our powers and procedures. Uh, for the fuel question, um, yes, we, we um, the fuel laundering hasn't gone away from Northern Ireland, um, um, or the island of Ireland indeed. Um, our relationship through the Joint Agency Task Force with the Revenue Commissioners and the support we receive from PSNI predominantly, uh, and then Gardashir Connor, to tackle what is a very uh, transient, cross-border um, criminality with environment, environmental impacts as well is still there. Um, we are, um, we believe we've driven this down. I think it's already, it's, it's outlined in the, in the OCTF report, I think, but from um, 2002, 2003, when we think illicit fuel had something like a 19% penetration of the, of the legitimate market, it's now down to 1%. We're not complacent around that, and we're working very, very hard to look at the latest evolution of fuel laundering, which unfortunately is distillation. And the distillation method is dangerous, um, where organised crime groups are looking at uh, heating the fuel, for want of a better expression, or boiling, trying to boil the marker out uh, at really extreme temperatures. Uh, and we've taken a couple of these plants out and been able to go public with that, which is which has garnered a lot of public support, actually because of the health and safety risks associated to that. So I hope, Chair, in a, in a, that, that answered your, your question, hopefully. OK, yes, thank you, Steve. Um, so we'll bring in other members at this stage. Um, Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you give some assessment of the impact that the commencement of the relevant provisions of the Criminal Finances Act might have on the functions of the Organised Crime Task Force? Just, I have a couple of other questions, but I'll, I'll probably do them one at a time. Just another wee point that I thought might be helpful for members. When I was on the policing board, Barbara, you may be aware of this, we had a presentation down in Grosvenor Road which outlined the differences between the organised crime task force and the paramilitary it, and where they cross over. <coughs> I think that was really, really helpful and it might be helpful for the members in this committee if, if I think it was Darren gave it to us at that time. So if, if it was possible for that to be forwarded on to the committee, I think it would be helpful just to get a grasp of those things because it can be very confusing and sometimes you think you're talking about one thing when you're actually talking about the other. So I think if, if we can get that. But I'll leave you to answer that question. That was just a suggestion. <laughs> well, well, I can sort out the presentation. Um, no problem. And I've actually forgotten what the question was now. Criminal sorry, friends. Oh, sorry. The impact of the commencement of CFA. Do you want me to pick that up? Um, commencement of the uh, Criminal Finance Act will be will bring a lot of new, of new powers. The, the the banner headline is often the unexplained wealth orders, 
and you'll have seen we've had some significant successes and some challenging times in court around uh, basically asking uh, someone who has got lots of money who we can't really show why they've got the money to explain why they've got it. It's a, it's a bit of a marquee type programme and has proven really beneficial in some areas. The more important bit of the legislation though is the account freezing orders, which is where we can go into the, the, the providers of banking services and get accounts frozen uh, to stop the criminal activity, to stop the flow of funds and to, to really start our investigations. Um, giving that capability in Northern Ireland, which we currently have in England and Wales, will be hugely significant in terms of the, the ability to tackle uh, those who are living beyond their wealth, those who are causing harm in communities, and they're seen driving around, and, and this was almost a direct lift from a quote from one of your team, Barbara, the people who are driving the Range Rovers living in houses that are extended beyond the, the, the way they should be, and with the permatan and the, the fake white smile. So these are the people, uh, to characterise it a wee bit, that we're looking to take on with this legislation. And I think there are plenty of candidates within Northern Ireland that would fit that bill. Um, not all male, not all female, but there's a certain uh, opportunity that we've not been able to pursue at this point, and this, this legislation will give us a certain capability that's not been open to us yet. Following on from that then, Chair, the, the new offences, the um, new organised crime offences, and, and obviously we did respond to the, the consultation around those, and I, I think that if they're used in the manner in which they're, I think, intended, and that is to, to get those people who are particularly, not exclusively, but around drugs, where we very often find in our communities that people who are taking drugs or who are caught with small amounts, who are very often addicts themselves, who are dealing for those who are at the top, and, and we can never get to the people who don't have drugs on their person. So will these offences actually allow you to, to get to those people who are directing it? Well, um, well, if I can, and I know Steve wants to come in. Do you want to come in at this point? I just wanted to come in at a point, actually, that Craig made, if you don't mind. Um, um, just really to give a bit uh, of, a, of an example how, uh, outside of PCTF, uh, the Fraud Investigation Service of HMRC have a fairly small proceeds of crime team working within FIS. And I wanted to do, if I could provide you with a sort of comparison, I know that the start of this conversation from you was around um, the two million or, or what seemed like uh, not a large figure in terms of confiscation. So by comparison, a similar size proceeds of crime team, purely looking at HMRC assigned matters in the northeast of England, have got account freezing orders in under with using the Criminal Finance Act worth uh, six and a half million pounds. And 5.7 million pounds of that is due for forfeiture uh, in March, March next year. And, and that, I hope, gives you a little bit of a, an insight into what we would hope to achieve, given similar powers in Northern Ireland with a similar power with size team, and that's just HMRC. Sorry, Bob. Yeah. No. Thank, Thank you. And sure. Sorry, Barbara, before you come in, I'm not sure that I, I properly explained that. So whilst I was following on from the question, I'm talking about the actual, the proposed offences. So that's the organising element of, you know, so those who are organising but aren't actually caught with anything on their, their person. These are the, new, the Judy. You might actually be the person in relation to this. These are the DOJ's proposed new offences, not rather than what's the the finances, the finance act. Yeah, it's, just, it's the kind of people pulling the strings. I think is is the point. Um, I, I suspect either Barbara or Craig would have a view on that. Well, I I think it's absolutely imperative that we do say any um, additional legislation that we can have uh, as all of the law enforcement agencies uh, represented here that um, helps bring those uh, offenders to justice is absolutely welcome. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, I do hope that uh, the committee will be somewhat reassured also by the work that has been carried out um, through Operation Phonetic, which um, I think members will be familiar with. It received quite high profile, obviously, earlier this year. But it has hit right at the heart of really serious criminality right across um, the United Kingdom and particularly within the shores of Northern Ireland um, here as well. So far within the operation um, that locally has been named Op Pharmac, but it's, it's reflective of that NCA led operation, there have been 31 arrests, 30 people charged 
and 208 offences, or 30 people charged with 208 offences. Now, those offences are the high-end offences, offences that include conspiracy to murder, uh, possession of firearms with intent to endanger life, um, and very clearly about the importation, importation and possession of Class A, B and C controlled drugs. There has also been significant seizures on the back of that. And again, that is the people we, we believe our assessment on this is, this is getting to the heart of those very people um, that, uh, Linda, you're, you're referring to, um, that are the ones that traditionally have kept their hands clean, basically, used and exploited others, um, those who may be vulnerable um, through, be it addiction, be it debt, be it a, whatever um, particular circumstance they're in. But certainly the figures that I have here is regard seizures of drugs alone, never mind the, the cash, the vehicles that have come in around that. There's been 86 kilograms of cocaine, um, 2.9 kilograms of herbal cannabis, 3.5 ki kilograms of cannabis resin, um, huge quantities of diazepam, tamazepam, Lyrica um, and others, and large, large quantities of mixing agents for class A drugs. So this is an operation that continues. Um, the information and our intelligence and evidence gathering and investigations absolutely continue um, at that higher end. And we do that uh, collectively again as, uh, as joint agencies. Linda, could I maybe use a case to, um, to um, show what we've done in England with the criminal finance legislation? Uh, we ran an operation uh, on a male in West Yorkshire who was facilitating and providing money and supplies to the organised crime groups there who were then importing drugs and guns and various other commodities. Um, the civil recovery team based in Belfast ran an operation against them. So the same people that we use uh, in both the Paramilitary Crime Task Force uh, and to support operations in, in Northern Ireland ran an operation which has taken £10 million out of them uh, through the Criminal Finances Act. Um, this is someone who has no convictions and has never been in trouble with the police before, but is seen as having made significant money through the proceeds of crime. And £10 million worth of the property empire which he has invested in has now been sold and will be uh, sent back to the Exchequer for a uh, redistribution uh, in the way it is done. The benefit for me on this is the expertise that we've built up through the legal team here and the civil recovery investigators is quite exceptional and will be brought to bear in, in the use of the, use of the new Criminal Finance Act legislation. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Thank you Linda. Sinead Bradley. <coughs> thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Sinead, thank you. Thank we can you hear you now. Thank you, Chair. Um, just reading through the report, and thank you, it is quite thorough, and there's plenty in there, and I know we come from our previous presentation, a lot of the answers of questions we had asked at that point are contained in this much more detailed document. But I'm looking at, in particular, um, and not specifically, but the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol piece, where you talk about that a new um, smuggling subgroup has been set up. I was just wondering when that was established, and I also noticed that the analyst forum are working with that subgroup to look at um, pulling together, I suppose, expert knowledge on any pending threats. But I am concerned um, with that piece and also um, what Linda was talking about there, about you know potential new crimes, how dependent all these are, their success being dependent on data sharing and ultimately um, you feel that we can factor in um, sufficient ways of getting around or managing the fact that there could be an absolute void in a lot of the data that may have been used on all of that type of work. So in terms of the smuggling subgroup, um, and it's, it's back to this partly the distinction between OCTF and PCTF. We had a really useful session with the entire organised crime task force earlier in the year, and smuggling was identified as, as a particular issue that we wanted to look at. Um, in terms of the exact date of establishment, I, I would need to check, although I did hear discussions today about when it was due to meet, so um, it, it, is a, it is a live um, group around that. On data sharing, maybe Barbara, do you want to start? Um, yes. Um, at the moment, I do, don't have high levels of concern 
around there being a void in the data sharing. Um, I think there's been a lot of work uh, has gone into place um, to ensure that um, such matters will be addressed. Um, I know that those uh, continue and can't really be finalised um, until, uh, I suppose, in the next week or so. So, yes, we are wary and, um, I suppose, trying to plan around should there be any um, sort of lag in the transition that, that, will, um, that will move through. But um, certainly from my point of view, and I don't know what um, others, others feel within this, um, I know there, there are a lot of people working hard, both um, legislatively um, and politically, um, to ensure that such, such a, a void doesn't happen. Yeah, I was going to say, I think, I think the Joint Agency Task Force, the cross-border agency task force, has given us great structure and relationships um, to, to constantly assess I think part of your question was the Northern Ireland Protocol and, yeah. and EU exit. And there will be, I think, fraud does evolve. We are risk assessing that across the agencies and across the island of Ireland as best we can as to where that might come from, what that might look like. But I do think, and it sounds evasive, but it's not. The devil is in the detail, really, about some of the um, tariffs and duties and whatever that, that um, those systems and processes come in. What I can say is that, and, conf and concur with Barbara and, and Craig, there's an enormous amount of um, cooperation and, and, uh, between the agencies to share um, intelligence and trends and try and identify and anticipate. And I take some comfort from the really strong relationship we have operationally and strategically across the island of Ireland. Is, is it okay just if I um, say at this, and it is just, I suppose, to maybe help, because I am aware about um, so many references that we have made to task forces here, and um, <laughs> are, are, um, just to make sure our reference points. Um, so just for knowledge, the Joint Agency Task Force is really more a coordinating body as such. It's jointly chaired by myself and the Deputy Commissioner of Angarda Shrikona, um, and through that there are six thematic areas that um, refer to cross-border crime. Um, and I do think it is worthy of emphasis that we have built through that really strong um, multi-agency, not just between the guards and the police service, but between the revenue um, a, a, a institutions, between other uh, law enforcement agencies. But no matter how well those relationships are established, none of us can operate outside legislation as regards where that data sharing is. But I think that strong relationship building has really been able to form um, you know, coherent and a, a co cohesive um, presentations around what is required for the legislation. And I know then the organised crime um, subgroup of the Joint Agency Task Force, I'm trying not to use the word task force again, um, met, or met yesterday or as part of the Joint Agency Task Force to, just to ensure that operationally everything was in place that possibly could be at this time. Yeah, I, I suppose I'd probably want to add the, the international element of what we do as an organisation. So our international uh, liaison officer network has uh, in the normal circumstances about 150 officers uh, placed around the world in strategic points to ensure that we can cooperate, not just in Europe, but with Colombia and the, the Americas and various other places. Um, we currently have an ILO within Dublin, uh, works very closely with Angarda Shikona, uh, and we are doubling the resource we have down there. So one to two, it's not a huge number, but it will ensure that we are consistent in how we approach things. Um, I do have a touch of nervousness, I've got to admit. I think we will have access to the same capability eventually. I think things will slow. So, for example, yeah. European arrest warrants are something that we and the NCA and the PSNI do the same, uh, are reliant on in terms of bringing back those who've committed crimes here uh, from European shores. Um, it is all, in all likelihood we will lose access to European arrest warrants and other tools as well. But we will have a uh, we'll return to what I remember as a young detective. Uh, we will have commissioned robotoirs and we'll have to go and seek judicial assurance and agreement in the form of parks and all these things that we had 20 years ago, 25 years ago, before the EAWs. Um, so we'll still be able to operate, we'll still be able to get to the same outcome at the end of the day. It may take us a bit longer uh, and that's the thing that I, I, I do have a concern about. And whether that's a negotiated deal or a, a non-negotiated deal, um, mm -hmm. I think we'll be in a position that, that will affect us for a period of time. 
Yeah. Okay, I appreciate your honesty in that because you know I, I would share some of those concerns. Um, you know the presentations that came to us about suboptimal positions. They are. They're just that. They're suboptimal. And I, I um, you know, we all know it, and it doesn't take me to say it. Anybody who is ill willed towards the protocol or is trying to find a manipulative way uh, to navigate it. Um, one thing we know that it's famous on their side. How they managed to very quickly navigate through that. And that is that window of time, I suppose, I, I am concerned about. But I, I do take comfort from what you're saying in terms of that operationally, you're trying to pin this down as tight as you can um, at this stage. And I suppose that's all that can fairly be asked of you. So I, I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Rachel Woods. Thank you, Chair. And thank you all for your presentation and the documents today. It was um, very, very interesting. I have um, a number of questions on the report, but just um, to start, Julie, at the start you'd said that there were 90 groups being monitored. In terms of the definition of organised crime groups, are you, in terms of, and, and then 90, what do you mean by group? Is it more than two people or are we looking at wider, larger networks? Yeah, so, so I think I said there's in the region of 80 that PSNI monitor. Um, in, in terms of definite, definition of groups, and this is one of the things we've been consulting on, um, I, I think um, certainly in Europe it's either two or three. Barbara may know the answer to that question, um, but it can be as small as that. It's not necessarily 15 or 20 people, so it is two or three people. Um, I think we're probably going to end up with a definition of two, but working together consistently um, around that. <coughs> Sorry, Barbara. Yeah, but, um, and, and that, that is what it is. Um, the majority of the organised crime <coughs> groups that we monitor will be more than the the, the three um, that uh, provides that definition by all accounts. Um, but um, the thing that we need to be cognizant of is they are often fluid between um, some of the, the different groups. So they do move about. We have uh, criminals who you know are, um, I suppose, willing to go to whoever pays the best price or wherever the best dividend is. Um, you know, there's some relatively tight groups say, stay is pretty autonomous, um, but there is a fluidity within them as well. So I hope I hope that helps. It is. It does remain on average in and around. You know, uh, the the eighty organised crime groups because some can fall on, some can come off if they've been dismantled, um, or they uh, through through criminal justice outcomes or through interventions, um, but others will um, just, as I say, maybe merge into other uh, OCGs as well, but it is generally in and around that number. Okay, thank you. Let me pick up. Oh, yeah. I don't think it's an exact science, and the more we uh, reach into it, the more intelligence we get, the better the material we have, the clearer it becomes, but that number of 80 is about right. It sort of varies. The venetic operation that uh, Barbara mentioned earlier on is key to that. That showed us that groups are much more fluid than we possibly realised previously. They will pursue the money profit um, wherever they can. And that means sometimes linking up with others they've not worked with before for an incident or a series of incidents uh, to make that profit. So the bit for us is the better the information we have, the better we understand it, the more capability we can bring to address it. Thank you. Um... Much appreciated in terms of that. Um, I'm going to go straight to the report, um, which we've been given, and a number of questions on three sections of it. But just the first one, there's a piece on insider threats on cybercrime. Um, could you elaborate a wee bit more on this, what the na nature of those issues are? And also, it says that there's been an absence of exit protocols within the PSNI. Have those been rectified? I um, apologise, I will have to come back to you on that. Um, apologies for that. I don't okay. know the answer. Um, no problem, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, the ransomware, which is detailed around the use of Bitcoin and the dark web, the report states that PSNI advice is for businesses not to pay if they've been subject to this. How prevalent is this in Northern Ireland? And if the advice isn't to pay, what kind of options are there for businesses out there or the people affected to do in terms of support? 
So, um, and I will look uh, to NCA colleagues on this one as well. So first and foremost, um, it is the preventative um, message um, and there, there is a huge amount of engagement, not only through our own Cyber Crime Centre, but also through the Northern Ireland Cyber Crime Centre and through national advice that we have um, a, with the National Crime Centre, a Cyber Crime Centre as well, um, just really on how businesses can best protect themselves. That's a really, really critical part. Um, in every single case, we encourage um, anyone who feels that they may be a victim of this to report, because it is only through that reporting that we can um, get investigative strategies in place and seek to um, identify the offenders and hopefully bring the offenders to justice. It is difficult and um, there's generally an international um, dimension to all of that. Um, do you want to come in on that international dimension yeah. Greg, at this point? But yeah, you'll be aware that um, there's talk all the time of uh, state actors and, and other parties involved in this, uh, this activity. Um, we can't prove or disprove that on many occasions, but what we can say is very often the threat that is made and the demands that are made are much uh, more extreme and uh, explicit than the reality of what's happening in someone's system. So the bit for me is about making sure you go at the earliest point possible to local law enforcement or ourselves for the issue and get the appropriate advice because very often we can do things to mitigate the threat uh, rather than someone paying out or getting involved in bitcoins or getting involved in uh, wallets that they don't really understand how they work and trying to navigate through that when in reality all that needs to happen is someone to press a switch and it happens again and they're re-victimised at that point. So the bit for me is about, yes, I look to work with law enforcement partners, look to take National Cyber Security Centre advice, um, engage in that from a preventative point well before you're attacked and then just keep on top of your security. If you do that then you will hopefully be kept much more secure. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't prevent every attack but you can actually reduce the risk and reduce the harm of it if you are attacked. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go on to the section on drugs, um, which is extensive. And it was mentioned by Julie in your opening remarks about the harms that um, drugs cause in our communities and society. But without going into alternative and more effective ways in which to deal with the cost of drugs, both in terms of health and society and addiction, um, that is for another time. Um, but the drug seizures data on page 63, there is a table with some figures on it, and I do love some figures, but they are obviously quite complex and need to be interpreted correctly. I'm just wondering if those figures are PSNI or are they from the Organised Crime Division collectively? So, so unhelpfully, my page 63 doesn't have a table on it. We might be looking at two different documents. Um, I, I, think, PSNI, yeah, I, I think if I can help there, I too don't have page 63, but um, all of the uh, drug statistics will be what has been confirmed through the, um, the National or the Statistics Agency, and those will be the confirmed um, drugs figures for Northern Ireland for this time. So are they, are they based on a mix of PSNI data, or is it on another agency, or is it just from the PSNI? I think it's your page 28. Apologies. Just to be helpful, I think it's, 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 I think it's page 28. Yes, yeah, sir. Apologies, my yeah, so, is so, so, I can't look at it. So, yes. so the statistics report will come through. They will all be the um, will be PSNI, but um, ultimately, if there is a seizure that. Um, you know, if it's an operation that the NCA have led on, that will still be reflected within those figures. Okay, thank you. Um, within the footnotes on that table, and I guess, sorry, I can't, I can't look at it now because I can't access it, but it says that not all drug seizures are subject to forensic testing to co officially confirm the drug type seized. Um, and it would be based then on the investigating officer's assessment of the drug type. Um, what kind of training is given to officers to assess drug types? And um, so there, there is basic um, training that goes through that. Much of that management is around actually, uh, I mean, really the total management around what our forensic um, capability and capacity, or, or the capacity for our forensic um, services are. Um, and when, um, you know, perhaps a, 
small quantities were going forward that would be quite obviously cannabis and in the past that that would have been tested to be um, uh, confirmed as cannabis but now that that's a you know that is left to officer assessment so it is carried through just um, really I suppose in basic training and then within uh, there is joint training that goes on as well. There's, there's really easily used little test kits called field test kits so if you're deploying uh, so one of our operations we will deploy you take a small sample out of, of one of the packages you put it in and you shake it up with a chemical and depending on the color that comes back we'll tell you which drug it is very often it's quite uh, easily to understand what it is because of the nature of smell the, 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 the the feel of the drugs. Um, so generally they're well aware, but they're backed up by these field test kits. Great, thank you. Um, in terms of the data collected then between PS9 and NCA, um, is there any data collected by on drug seizures by weight and quantity? Yeah, there, there would be, um, certainly, um, and even just the figures that I gave, um, earlier as regards some of the seizures that we have you know it does refer to x amount of kilograms or grams of um of a uh, whatever the the actual drug is so yes it would be um but generally that will be converted into money uh, as such i have to take a look at it, it um Sorry, yeah it, i suppose it's just to understand is there anything else that I can help with as regards no, that just, question. I'm just interested to know because obviously we have a table in front of us about incidents, but is that um, an incident of, of a teenager, say, for example, or, or you know, being caught with a five bag on them, or is it uh, someone who has been caught with ten, 10 kilograms of cocaine and it's counted as an incident? Um, I suppose it's just, with, with, especially with regard to the table there with the incidents of herbal cannabis, um, quite, a, quite a substantial leap. Um, but is that, you know, as I say, is it a small amount um, being being found, or is it at larger quantities? Um, it just was. It's just easier to find out where, you know, and, and again, it was happening in England, Wales, where the police resourcing has been put to. And it was mentioned earlier on. You know, if you put more resources to something, you'll find more. It doesn't mean that there's more prevalence of it in society, but it's just that there's more more focus on it. So I'm I'm just particularly interested in. Um, what, you know, incidents versus quantities and how that's portrayed. Yeah, yeah, and I, 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 I totally under, understand um, the question. So actually, yes, an incident is an incident, no matter what size the seizure is. But I think it's important um, to sort of highlight that within our drugs operating model as such, we do have three levels. Um, our, a, Police uh, and community safety partnerships, um, very, very clearly, and uh, I think without exception, every local policing plan, drugs is identified as an issue. And the majority of those in the sentiment that comes through from communities that certainly presented to us through other groups, and particularly the PCSPs, is about the harm that street level dealing. Um, brings to their communities uh, the issues then and we referred earlier as regards exploitation of young people debt you know the potential to grow on into um, um, sort of wider wider addiction is a really key issue around um, our focus on harm and vulnerability um, and that is something that we would certainly uh, want our neighbourhood teams to be focused on um, our local uh, uniform colleagues um, who are out there 24/7 delivering the 24/7 placing and um, to be to be totally focused on. To me, uh, the the next stage of that is that um, piece where the um, that really when we would start working. Um, particularly with um, NCA again, but it's around the importation, the, the bigger um, operations, I suppose, the supply um, and for, uh, from the, the mainland as such, um, and how we look uh, within the wider United Kingdom and what that, what that supply looks like, and how then within a more specialised detective um, sphere that uh, that will tie in with really the work of the organised crime gangs, uh, many of the organised crime gangs that we've talked about here, that'll work 
um, probably across um, the you know the island of Ireland, um, but across the, the borders through with Scotland um, and England particularly as well. And then when we get to the, the top piece, that's really where the NCA um, come in. Um, very much around the international supply because all of this comes from from somewhere um, and that's where a lot of the effort will go in from the uh, the support that we'll get from NCA around developing those lines of investigation um, that as Craig had referred to earlier will stop the, the harm basically coming to the shores here or at least get the leads in place that interventions can be put in place so um, Yes, an incident is an incident, but um, you know, collectively, and I hope you, you have been able to get a flavour today of some of the really high-end um, uh, interventions that have taken place with really, really significant seizures. Is there... Um, Chair, if I may, on, on the harm theme, um, Rachel, you touched on the sort of, you know, it, it's, it's a conversation we're in today in terms of addiction services and so on. Um, but one of the things that we as a department are trying to to support operational partners through the Community Safety Board is to look at um, vulnerable people at places and at powers to make sure that at every level um, we're addressing the vulnerability. So, you know, what you're hearing today is the kind of hard edged um, drugs in the community. But similarly, through support hubs, for example, it's that how can we collectively make sure that we know the people who are vulnerable um, and whether it's through addiction or homelessness or whatever the issue is that's being addressed by other bits of the system um so the law enforcement piece comes in when needed on the back of that and um, i'm not sure if that is helpful yep thank you very much um no appreciate your answers there finally just on the section on immigration crime and human trafficking um and i appreciate this is the sort of the hard edge um with regard to to the, the task force but is there any role for the group to assist victims when they're identified you know is there links there with um with groups and, and, and how do you deal with people that are found to be victims of crime especially if they're trafficked or if they've been um subject to you know, sort of well yeah the trafficking basically and, and and migrants um is there links with community organizations and support groups there um, so my understanding is that there is a, a, a you know good links within Northern Ireland. And again, those are um, carried through um, the organised one of the organised crime subgroups, which is very much a multi-agency group. Um, certainly, the figures that I have here um, at the moment show quite an a, an uptake um, a, as regards the national referral mechanism in that this uh, financial year to date. We've had 89 referrals there um, against 101 screening assessments. Now, that's opposed to last year, as regards referrals, there were 47, <coughs> and the screening assessments were 54 um, to, for the same reporting period. So there really is quite a, a, you know, quite a significant uplift within that. Through the organised crime subgroup, that is where a lot of the partner agencies come together, um, and a, that provides support um, to potential victims and importantly really um, also gives an opportunity around identification of potential victims that allows us then to get to that, that screening mechanism. Um, it certainly is work in progress. I think it's an issue that probably within um, many communities within Northern Ireland people don't really think it happens here, um, but we know it does. And um, I think it is something that there has been significant effort has has been committed to, um, thankfully over uh, over certainly the last the last year or so. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Gemma Dolan. Sorry, thanks, Chair. It's in the audience there. Um, I have two linked questions, but I'll go. Um, I'll ask one at a time. Um, can you give your assessment of the operation of the 4.3 million cybercrime centre that was open last year? Um, I can give you a bit more detail as to the type of functions it involved. Yes, I can. Um, I can indeed. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the the crime centre that. Um, is sitting within a uh, police service estate. Um, I have to say quite proudly is the envy of quite uh, a lot of other uh, police services. And I do see Craig 
nodding to my right, so I think it may be the envy of the National Crime Agency as well. Um, but even just to give you some, um, some idea of the extent of the investigations that happen, um, through the digital forensics uh, within this, the Cybercrime Centre, which is very much around the examination of computers and complex phone work, um, by the end of October this year, within the financial year, 904 devices um, had been um, examined. Um, a, 202 um, were, 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 were in process, if that makes sense. <clears throat> so um, that amount had, had been finished. 202 were in process. Uh, there was a significant amount um, of examinations um, and input against the serious crime, organi uh, organised crime investigation we've referred to a number of times around the opphonetic. So that certainly increased the demand there as well, and also towards the Op Orbasia um, investigation, which was an investigation into the new IRA. Um, so there is quite a throughput there. Um, the, uh, there are time frames that are agreed to, um, to try and get those processed to ensure uh, the, the kind of fastest time um, investigation. A, a criminal justice process can, can be um, implemented, but also to ensure that people actually can get their devices back as well. And there has been really quite some quite significant um, technology developments um, where during house searches, for example, there is screening that can be done. So if say we're in a house looking for indecent images and we go into a house where there's three computers and um, you know, three, three laptops, for example, and um, there, there is now a functionality that can provide screening around that. Um, and that means then we're not leaving that house with all of that equipment where there can be um, adverse impacts on maybe kids who, who you know, have been in that environment who are losing their computers with the, where the homeworks and everything are on. So there is a lot of developments um, happening around there, which um, I think are, are really beneficial. Um, and I think some of the other benefits we're seeing, and I don't really want to go into an awful lot of detail around it because obviously the investigation continues as well. But following the really um, sad events at Greenfield last year, when we were able to put um, sort of a mobile unit um, into the, the Cookstown area, and where a, a lot of people came forward, it was um, certainly unprecedented um, within um, our experience within the Police Service of Northern Ireland for so many to come forward to actually manage and it meant again we weren't having to seize phones off kids that were voluntarily coming coming um, forward and any like video footage or anything that was relevant to the investigation was able to be taken at that point. Um, so you know there's there's a lot of high end investigative work goes on. There's a lot of work that goes on also to support even around um, if there has been serious road traffic collisions, um, so uh, there, there, there is a lot of demand and it is growing. The capability also within the crime centre reaches out quite significantly to that preventative world that, that we talked about as well, um, which um, works really closely with business, works closely nationally to ensure that we have um, emerging trends that are coming through and that we're at the forefront and certainly for us as regards businesses there are a lot of international businesses have um, a footprint in Northern Ireland as well and we are um, very, very keen that they feel safe within these shores and that this isn't some sort of um, cyber a uh, crime hotspot so I hope that helps. I can I can provide to the committee sort of further data if if you would like further data on that at some point that, that can be provided. That's great, Barbara. Thank you. That's very interesting. Um, my last question is it's linked to the Cybercrime Centre, but um, obviously uh, very often our cybercrime isn't actually in this country. Um, so have you any idea how Brexit is going to impact the effectiveness of the Cybercrime Centre? Um. Well, again, I, I hope it won't, and I don't say that in any form of a naive way. Again, this is where we reach into an awful lot of that sort of a, a support um, that we can get from um, partner agencies as well, including uh, the National Crime Agency that have that international outreach. But we are very cognizant. We have dealt with um, some really um, a 
difficult cyber attacks that have, you know, they rarely originate in Northern Ireland, is the bottom line. They, they rarely origi originate within Ireland. Um, they are definitely, um, um, you know, coordinated multi-country global um, attacks on many occasions. And we do have, um, a, as our cyber crime centre is good, we do also need help um, by, by all accounts, not afraid to, to reach out and get that help um, from partner agencies who can reach um, probably much further further afield, much more easily if we do have to reach into, um, say, a, with, with um, American um, a law enforcement agencies there. I don't know, Craig, if from NCA yeah. point of view, is there anything else you want to add on that? But Probably two or three points. First, yes, I was incredibly impressed with the, the centre. I think PS and I have got a really um, a jewel in the crown in, in terms of their investigative capability and their ability to actually exploit the data that we get back from devices. Um, I don't think Brexit is an, an issue really for cyber criminality. I think for law enforcement, the bigger issue at the moment is the volume of data we're having to manage. So we're now starting to see your know, mobile phone devices that if you printed out every piece of data on a page of, uh, of A4, you can stack it as high as the Empire State Building and still keep going. So that is the volume of data just from a mobile phone. So from one of the top end Apple phones, that is the volume of data that you're dealing with. And if you take, for example, an operation Venetic, some of the people we were dealing with had five Apple phones in their pockets all for different purposes. So if you think five stacks of paper the height of the Eiffel Tower, that we've got to work our way through to understand what is in there for the criminal prosecution or assisting the defence uh, for disclosure purposes, that is huge. One of the things the NCA has invested in very heavily is what's called the National Data Exploitation Centre, NDEC. And NDEC is basically where we take these really complex investigations and pieces of, of you know, information that we take off devices and wash the data with data scientists. Now, I'm already going beyond my knowledge and understanding <laughs> of what they do with the data because it is incredibly complex data science to do this. But an example of that um, was the really tragic circumstances last year in Essex when the 39 migrants died. Can you imagine how many devices were, were within that shipping container? And we were able to take that data in very short order and provide really clear evidence to um, the inquiry team on what was happening and who was involved in that and from that we spun out some of our own operations um, including one which is going to sentence it fairly soon uh, a chap from Northern Ireland who now lives in Warrington who is a heavy haulier and was a came into the intelligence picture on this and has now been a in fact he pled guilty to four offences of <coughs> drug importation and money laundering and that's on the back of <laughs> huge pile of data through effective data science and then drawing inferences from it. Chair, I, I wondered if um, I could be so bold as to um, ask, could I, I share just, um, I, it's, it's information just about a, a really excellent programme that is coming in place, is that okay? Yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's a, and I know members will be interested in this. Um, it's a school cyber online education package, which was due to have been launched just in, in the last um, week or so. Um, it's been developed jointly between our own um, sort of prevent cyber um, officer, the Northern Ireland Cyber Security Centre and the Education Authority. Um, but it's very clearly um, designed to um, I suppose help young people who may have made um, mistakes or um, uninformed or irrational decisions around um, kind of entering into that, you know, playing around in that um, cyber world, but actually um, a world that they could uh, become criminalised in. Um, so it really is very much around um, avoiding criminalising young people and assisting schools in how to deal with that low level cyber dependent offending um, and help avoid repetition. So it's very much a preventative an education and a preventative um, a program that is in place. Um, it also gives an opportunity because um, a lot of, and I really don't want to stigmatise because it's not only young people can do this, but actually they're more adept in many cases in that sort of post-primary school at, um, you know, it's sort of computers than, than many, many of the rest of us might be, or I'll speak for myself. 
um, but it's also um, to be able to tap into that to help inform them, help educate them, and then really advocate cyber security as a career pathway, and um, which really does um, you know, uh, shape uh, a certain positivity about those, those specific skills that they have. Um, it is a program that's easily modified and, and uh, can, can fit several different circumstances, um, but it has allowed academia, it has allowed the industry and it has allowed law enforcement to really come together and offer support and hopefully, uh, hopefully um, assist in reducing crime and uh, stopping young people from coming into the criminal justice sphere. So I just thought I'd take that opportunity. Thank you, Chair. No, excellent. And you're, you're quite right to blow your own trumpet in this respect, and, and well done for that. Gemma, are you happy? I'm indeed. Yeah, I'm happy. That's grand. Thank you. OK, thank you. OK, members, we still have um, Paul Frew, Gordon Dunn, Doug Beatty and Emma to go. OK, so in that order, Paul Frey. I'd be brief, Chair. Can I first of all thank everybody in that room there for what you do for us all, protecting us all against criminality? Thank you very much. Uh, can I take you to page 11 of your results, highlights in the report uh, for 2019-2020? Uh, there was 8,177 drug seizures, but only 3,819 drug-related arrests. How is that possible? Because not um, not every seizure will lead to arrest. That will not necessarily be the outcome for every um, every seizure. There may be other community resolution outcomes, um, and uh, there there may be reports which will reports for prosecution, which um, would not um, warrant the uh, necessity or the proportionality or necessity. Um, as regards arrest, there may be some other um, seizures that happen that there are not. Um, so, so the items are fine, but actually there's nobody with them. And uh, for example, some of the the, the large seizures, uh, th there may not be associated arrests. Okay. There may also be another answer, and I, I'm sorry to cut across. In some uh, jurisdictions, counting rules require. Uh, seizures to be recorded for different types of drugs. So if you get a, an, an amount of cannabis and an amount of cocaine, that's recorded as two seizures. I'm not sure how it is here, Barbara, but there's certainly some of that in England and Wales. No, just, just reading the report, I think I read it on the footnote that that wasn't the case of the double accounting because there will be multiple times whenever there's two types of drugs found. So I think I did read it apart that in order to keep your sums right, that, that wouldn't ha that wouldn't be able to happen, and that's why you've got the eight thousand drug seizures. Uh, that's that's only forty seven percent of drug seizures had led to arrests. Now, the year before it was forty four percent, so it is an improving picture. But are you telling me then that the the other percentage, the the, the fifty three percent? are all of a, such a low-level nature that you don't warrant arrests, and there are other ways and means then to facilitate that law, functioning rule. Now, I, I note that 74, about 74% 74 of those 8,000 drug seizures were cannabis-related, that, so that might be the case. But there are, there's bound to be many times, multiple times, when there is a massive amount of cannabis seized which would lend itself then to believe that it's at the higher level and echelons of organised crime. So, so are we saying that with only 47% of drug seizures leading to arrests, that they can all be accounted for with regards to the other means of disposal? No, I can't definitively say that. It is something um, I'm more than happy to revert in writing to the to the committee on, um, because I don't have the definitive answer um, before before me here at at this time. So I think um, what what I was presenting was potentially options or uh, reasons as to why it may not be. But I I'll, I'll certainly revert to the committee on writing um, as regards that. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, can I ask them, why did seizures and arrests drop in 2016-2017? It's the only year in the last decade, I think, or since reporting began, that there has been a drop, albeit slight, but still a drop compared to every other year. I 
again, I don't have an, an analysis uh, around that. Um, so I, I do apologise. I, I don't. I don't. I can't give any. Uh, you know, I could speculate, but I can't give you any uh, specific reason no. as to why. No, that's fine. Um, we can wait. In that particular no, year, it would have. It would have been less. We can wait. We can wait. Uh, One hundred and eighty-nine drug-related deaths in twenty eighteen, more than double than recorded the decade ago. Total decade ago was eighty-nine. Uh, also, that's an increase of 39% when compared to 2017. Can we say in any shape or form that policing around drugs is a success? So I think it's very important to understand the context around the 189 drug-related deaths um, because m many of those deaths relate to polydrug use um, they are. They relate to um, a, some of them. Can again, I don't have the figures here in front of me at this time, um, but I, I think naturally people's minds tend to go to it's been you know heroin overdose or a I don't know, cocaine use or something. Um, a lot of times this is down to the misuse of prescription drugs. Um, we know now that a a sort of prescription drugs, I guess, can be um, accessed uh, through the internet uh, by, by post. So certainly um, it, is, it is an issue and in not every case may potentially be su suggest uh, that um, I suppose there are, there are illegal causes around it, but I mean, I, I, I do think um, there, there, there are issues. I, I think it is really, really important here to. I mean, absolutely, the number of drug deaths has has increased. Certainly, the figures that I have to date this year, there is a little bit of a drop around that. But I think, as a wider society, we should be really concerned around it. Um, I, I, I really do. Um, and again, I, I firmly believe that it is not just something that the police can be responsible for. I know we're working closely with the um, Department of Justice um, and certainly around the establishment of the Community Safety Board and how collectively other agencies can come together and really seek to address the, um, the, the uh, issue of drugs misuse in Northern Ireland. Um, because you know what, what we don't, what I don't have the, the figures of, or um, haven't seen the links to, but even potentially how that ties in with suicide rates in Northern Ireland as well, and does that issue to drug dependencies, or is that related to you know issues of debt and everything? And I think there's real, real opportunity to work through again with our local. Um, Police and community safety partnerships, which I referred to earlier, and how uh, drugs um, is a priority, um, certainly to my knowledge, of every single um, PCSP um, in Northern Ireland. But how we can work collectively then through that community safety partnership with PCSPs and with other agencies who are um, skilled, I suppose, in the addiction services and in doing that. And as a police service, we can certainly um, do, do our absolute best um, and as law enforcement agencies to, uh, you know, to intercept drugs, to, to um, get suppliers before the courts and to really just try and um, a, intervene at that level. Yeah, but I most know. definitely, and I know the members uh, will, will all agree around this, it, it is a much wider societal issue yeah, than I, I anything agree. that law enforcement can, can do itself. I, I agree. It but I think um, it's, it's really worthy raising, and I, and I thank you for, for raising it as such, because I just think it's such a such a prevalent issue uh, yeah. within Northern Ireland. And, and it's much more than a policing solution. I have absolutely no doubt about that, and I agree with you 100 per cent, Barbara. But just on the, on the same page there with regards to your result highlights, Approximately 2.2 million recovered from criminal assets. That's only about four or six large houses or 13 new sports cars. So my question is, how can we justify that as a success? And surely we need to be going after much more money and assets of the top criminal 
organised criminals in this country? Well, yeah, I, I know um, Craig's, Craig's going to come in here. Um, I, don't, I don't think that there is any um, lack of will or intent um, for, for us to do that. Um, I think it's also helpful to understand that some of these investigations can be um, quite lengthy investigations. Um, and again, um, I, I do think that we will see some results coming through around some of the interventions that have been in place recently. If I can, just before I hand over, refer, um, certainly as regards some of our paramilitary uh, groupings and those that are subject to the Paramilitary Crime Task Force, not necessarily looking at very asset-rich um, individuals either. Um, a lot of them, it's about the, the status and ego um, that, that can be fulfilled just around their control within communities. Um, and a, you know, that impacts it, but certainly as regards those other seizures, you know, um, Craig's looking to come in here. Yeah, I, I think, uh, thanks for the question. I think it's a really good point. We would be, and I think the next report will be uh, interesting on the back of the genetic material and the, the money we've recovered from that. You know, across the UK, including Northern Ireland, uh, it's over £55 million worth of cash we seized during the genetic period between April and June of this year. Um, we know that um, organised crime is a cash-rich business and that there is a, a huge amount of cash exported out of the country um, with various destinations including the Middle East and uh, um, Southern Europe. Part of our problem is making sure that we can get in front of that, so stop it going out of the country. And when we do stop it going out of the country, recovering it, that relies on good intelligence. But when you then have that money reinvested and laundered, back into legitimate uh, funds in the UK, that can be very difficult to get to the bottom of. Hence the reason that um, we're starting to see more and better seizures in, in England and Wales on the back of the illicit finance legislation. So the sooner we have that, and I, I sound like a broken record here, the sooner we have that, the better. But uh, I would be interested in, in your definition of a nice sports car, because that sounds very expensive. <laughs> OK, thank you. Can I ask, I, I believe, and I've said this to this committee before, that intelligence-led policing is vital in tackling organised crime. Does the NCA use informants? Um, you're going to take me into uh, areas of business that I would probably not want to answer detailed questions. Yes or uh, no? We use yes every, no. gamma, the, we use every um, opportunity that's allowed to us under legislation, and that includes the use of criminal intelligence uh, that is gained from uh, covert human intelligence sources. OK, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. OK, thank you. Gordon Dunn. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much for all the information. I think a lot of the points have been well made. I think we've all learned quite a bit from today's presentation. Um, I think we're all somewhat, I suppose, shocked at the number of criminal gangs that are out there. I was first made aware of it, I think, at our November meeting when we talked about the strategy. We talked around 82 groups, and I believe there's, there are more now. I think to the ordinary person in the street, that is very shocking and alarming that we have that number of, of groups operating in Northern Ireland. And I understand about a third of them are paramilitary linked. Is that true, that a third of them are still paramilitary linked? And are we making real progress on reducing the impact of paramilitary groups in, in relation to criminality? Um, so I, I'll um, certainly more than happy to lead on that. Um, yeah, we would assess about in, in and around a third do have paramilitary links. Um, I, I, I do think that there is significant progress is being made, certainly as regards enforcement with the paramilitary groups that sit under the, the Joint Agency Paramilitary Crime Task Force. Um, those include West Belfast UDA, um, North Antrim UDA, East Belfast UVF, uh, Inla in the Northwest, and Inla in Belfast. Um, certainly since the uh, creation of the Paramilitary Crime Task Force, and I can give some figures here, and if you, you, you bear with me, um, I'll, I'll not give you the whole list, but there have been 315 arrests in the time um, since, uh, since the task force has, has commenced. 
Um, there's well over 700 um, searches involved in that, 250 charges and reports that have come through, um, 187 vehicles. Sorry, let me just make sure I'm saying the right number here. Apologies. 187 uh, weapons and uh, ammunition have been seized, um, 57 vehicles, 53 of those in the last two to three years. Um, and equally in the last two to three years, 194 of 315 arrests happened. I mean, I, I, I could go on. It is, um, I, oh, I choose my words, um, probably clumsily, but it is a war of attrition. Um, and a, again, just back to the harm that, and we all know it, I don't have to rehearse it here, the, the harm and the, you know, the influence that individuals attached to paramilitary groups seek to exploit within their local communities. It's shameful. Um, and, you know, I, I said actually at the policing board last week, I believe they are feeling the pressure. Um, I believe they should feel the pressure, and I think they will feel the pressure, um, and that is the pressure from law enforcement. Um, I do know that, uh, again, pretty similar to my comments around the, uh, the, the drugs deaths, it isn't something that we can just place our way out of, and that can also often sound like a a trite statement. Um, I believe communities need to see enforcement in place so as they can feel empowered and actually other partner agencies and community groups and representatives can feel empowered to actually step forward and denounce the harm that they do. So, I mean, we're not going to get tired in our efforts. We're going to keep absolutely focused on it and we're going to use everything um, that we can through our partner agencies with HMRC, with NCA um, and, and we will continue. I should just put for the record, Chair, if you don't mind, I um, rehearsed um, the names of the groups that it was referring to. I didn't add, uh, I think, South East Antrim is one of those uh, groups that is also a key priority for the Paramilitary Crime Task Force. Okay, thanks for that. It's good to see progress has been made. In relation to surveillance and uh, observations and uh, checks, uh, at the airports, for example, and docks, and have harbours down there as well. Who's responsible for carrying those out, uh, obviously on a planned or even ad hoc basis? I think those sort of areas are, to, to the ordinary person in the street, are high risk areas. Is there enough surveillance and uh, observation work carried out there, and who is really responsible for it? Maybe I could answer that question. Um, border Force have got a presence uh, to do that. And if Border Force are seizing money, for example, or drugs or otherwise, then they'll refer that to ourselves in the first instance, uh, where we will either adopt if it's of a certain value or otherwise, uh, or ask the local force to get involved in doing that. Um, it's very much an area of business that the, the Chief Executive of Border Force, uh, who was across here and met with the Chief Constable, myself and others recently, is talking about uh, ensuring that the uplift he's had recently is sufficient to meet the, the, both the threat and risk just now and, and going forward. Um, we do a lot of work jointly. Um, to be honest, they are probably one of our biggest sources of uh, work uh, within the NCA, uh, and there's a very strong relationship with them to make sure that we are policing as effectively the borders uh, where, where uh, goods and people come in. If I could add to that, possibly. Um, because we have HMRC of the customs policy, and actually uh, similar to NCA, we have a great relationship with Border Force, and they will refer tobacco seizures. In fact, we did an operation yesterday, um, um, which was a follow-up to a referral from Border Force of a large um, uh, detection of cigarettes earlier in the year. So we have those tried and tested pathways, I think, um, for a sort of wider um, surveillance capability. All three agencies here have it. Um, not specifically at the borders, but as we will go back to the comment that was made earlier, where um, a lot of the policing or law enforcement is very much intelligence led. We all have the ability to, to go into the docks or the ports and conduct our own surveillance for specific operations. Again, in, in conjunction with border force and power agencies. 
Uh, and if, if I just may add to offer, um, I suppose some reassurance as well. Um, we did receive some additional EU exit funding, and um, that has led to additional officers being dedicated to the ports. Um, so they they are in place and have been for a period of time now. Does that include uh, random checks, even road checks? You know, the, the fact that yeah, a freight lorry can be stopped and, uh, and checked, the risk uh, you would feel is relatively low of that happening. But, you know, if it can be done on a random basis, I think it would certainly be a deterrent to those. It, it, it will. Uh, apologies, apologies, I jumped in there. Um, yes, yes, it will. It, it will, and that's absolutely um, what what we will be doing. And indeed, that we've been working hard on just, uh, I suppose, developing um, additional plans around that. That part was always there, and um, but just making sure that um, through our EU exit planning, particularly, um, that we have really good contingencies in place. Uh, so yeah, that's all in place. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Gordon. Um, Doug Beatty. Uh, thank you, Chair. Sorry, it took a while to come on there. Um, uh, team, thanks very much for, for that. It's been re extremely interesting, and, and I try, won't try and keep this uh, too much longer, but I'll maybe do some sweep up on some, some questions, if I can, um, that have already been asked. But uh, of the 80 um, organised crime groups operating in Northern Ireland, how many of them are resident in Northern Ireland, or how many of them are actually reaching into Northern Ireland? Or are the 80 what we're talking about actually in Northern Ireland? And this one third of them are paramilitaries, that's 26 or 27 paramilitary groups. Um, could you expand on that? I know you've done a little bit, but are we literally breaking down paramilitary organisations into specific uh, groups? Uh, and that's why that figure is, is um, so high. And just linked it to that, if I can ask, please. Um, uh, from Julie. Julie, when are we going to have the, the conversation with everybody in regards to language uh, and, and that language around what is a paramilitary, what is a criminal, what is organised crime uh, and what is criminality? Um, so I suppose if I start around, around that, okay, I will welcome, I know Julie's going to come back on that, but I also, um, on behalf of the police service, welcome that uh, conversation as regards the definitions. We certainly um, are very aware and have been talking about it. Um, and yes, it is um, 26 um, that we would say are linked to paramilitary groups. Um, and as members will be aware, so uh, you know, one paramilitary grouping um, can have different uh, sections as such, uh, below that again, um, that can and um, that would be broken down per ge geographical area as such. So even um, and if I use, uh, well, I can use any number of examples here. I suppose um, I use East Belfast UVF. There are different geographical areas within that and small groups within that, which we believe are carrying out um, different levels of, of criminality within their area. Um, all of those groups will be, um, so, you know, predominantly Northern Ireland based. That's why they'll, they'll sit a, a w within our matrix to, um, I suppose, score uh, within our criteria for OCGs. But they will have um, a reach. We believe that there are around 20 that will have a reach across um, the, the across Ireland, um, the, the island of Ireland, as such. Um, that we believe out of the top 11 within that sort of harm score that we have, um, nine of them will have that uh, cross-border reach as well. And then there are others, and that's very much where we have seen um, a lot of developing information and investigative lines, particularly through this year in 2020, that have gone across nationally and indeed internationally. Um, and. Uh, that, that I think remains, uh, as all of these things, as information and intelligence development does, very much an evolving picture. So, um, I, yeah, I, I, and, and, and you know, we, we just continue to absolutely focus, work with partners to build on as much information that we can to actually ensure that we are getting the best investigative opportunities that we can. Um, yeah, Doug, on the language point, um, 
that continues to be a focus. I, I would be misleading you to suggest it's been high on the list of things to do in the last few months. Um, we, we've been very, very focused on immediate harm, as you as you might expect. Um, it, it is on the kind of forward plan for the political advisory group, because in part, um, it is about um, elected reps views on all of this too. But certainly, as Barbara said, um, we have been working um, with police and others. I mean, you, you may notice in, in some of the social media from the Ending the Harm campaign that increasingly the emphasis on this is about criminality and harm no matter where it comes from. Um, so that, that shift has started and I think you'll, you'll probably see that, but there hasn't been a, a dedicated conversation around it in the last few months. We've been very much in the look at what's in front of us space. That would be the honest answer. Can I maybe jump in as well? Um, I think it's a really interesting point. Um, the point that Barbara makes about that pyramid of the sort of hierarchy of the groups. Um, we also see groups that from the UK mainland that reach across into Northern Ireland and are engaging with groups that are here. Um, one of our jobs and one of the things I mentioned earlier on is our um, ambition to tackle them before they get to Northern Ireland, hopefully before they get to the UK as a whole. Um, but the, the difficulty is, where is the best place to take action? So there are groups that are based and operate from here that are acting in Europe, and we have interdicted them on them in Europe. We've interdicted them on them uh, in the southeast of England, and we'll continue to do so because it's far easier to, to do that there and stop them coming all the way back across the UK onto a ferry and coming to, into Ireland itself. Um, our ambition is to stop that happening before it gets to the... Uh, our shores at all. Um, in, in terms of language, I, I, you know, I, I don't come from Northern Ireland. I don't have a long history of uh, law enforcement here, so it would be unfair of me to, to put my view on it. But what I would say is the groups that we're looking at and the groups of paramilitary crime task force are looking at are involved in criminality. And the law that we will use to tackle them is a criminal law. So for me, they're criminals. Um, the way I, my teams operate is to give respect to the, the intelligence suppose that we get and understand what they are, but let's go after them with whatever tool we can use, the, the old Al Capone type approach. What is the best way to take them out and stop them from operating them and to make the community safer? And we'll take that approach every time. Uh, and, and again, I, I'm, I'm agreeing with all these here. I mean, these are criminals and the last thing um, I like or anybody likes is for them to be given the sort of UD here um title which gives them a bit of kudos when they're actually just drug dealers um so that's really really important that, that we look we have that conversation uh, just something to pick up on on, on barbara that, that um that you said i mean we talked about the organized crime task force and the paramilitary crime task force and the joint agency task force and the nca the, the, the hmrc the smuggling subgroup um border force is there any chance we could get an organisational or structural um, wire diagram which shows us that C2, C3 um, relationship that's, that's not too operationally focused but just gives us a better under, understanding? Um, uh, and, and second on to that, just to, to take up time, um, there's real perception out there that the paramilitary crime, uh, the, sorry, the, the paramilitary task force doesn't really operate in some areas of the border. We certainly see them in, in areas throughout Northern Ireland and in inner cities, um, uh, you know, certainly into Newry, but, but there's certain areas between, I suppose, Newry uh, and, and some places in Fermanagh where there's a real sense that the paramilitary task force doesn't really operate. Who is covering that piece of ground who are looking after the the organised crime groups who are flying the flag of convenience um, by calling themselves uh, paramilitaries or even terrorists in some cases? Yeah, um, and I understand why the question is asked as such. Um, the Paramilitary Crime Task Force is um, the operational placing enforcement um, body that focuses on the fresh start groups the ones that I named uh, within this. It still sits within my department, within Crime Department, and indeed within the same branch as the Paramilitary Crime Task Force sit, where the investigation into other criminality as regards uh, the organised crime groups sit. So that all sits under my remit. Um, we, uh, within that branch, uh, within 
um, criminal investigation branch is the overarching uh, body there, or the, the key um, the points of contact with NCA, the key taskings with HMRC and NCA. So there's, uh, there is a definite, please be assured around that, there's a definite coordination uh, that sits within that. Also within my department, and you refer towards what would be seen as terrorist groups, i.e. dissident Republican groups, they sit with under under my remit as well, but the the difference being that within that we have MI5 um, support around those distant Republican groups because they are deemed as a threat to national security. So they all sit under my remit, um, and certainly that coordination and tasking uh, goes there. Paramilitary Crime Task Force on the Fresh Start groups, and then the wider organised crime investigative teams. I sit sit um, underneath my, my remit um, as well, and also just I mean for absolute assurance, we work really really closely. The majority of my policing service has been in uniform policing in districts, and some of the members know me from uh, from my my past there as well. We work really really closely with district colleagues. Um, also, um, we ensure that we are the I, I suppose the the link for um, Steve and his teams, for um, Craig and their teams, whenever uh, we're, we're doing collective operations across Northern Ireland as well. Um, so, uh, you know, as there are different groups under, under different investigative bodies, they all sit under Crime Department um, under, under my command, I guess. Uh, and, I, and I guess, Barbara, I mean, I, I, I'm, I've got real confidence um, without a shadow of a doubt, I guess the point is, uh, and it's the original point is, you know, because I don't think I fully understand that C two three C three sort of relationship um, with all those different groups, and, and therefore it's hard to understand. And 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 you're explaining to us as best you can, but it would be really good if there was any um, not too operational wild wild diagram that could be produced. Can I just ask another question, please? And I don't know who this falls under, but I'll ask uh, anyway. Uh, UK Border Force. Um, who are likely to be operating at our airports, who, who are likely to be operating in our ports um, uh, of Larne and and, uh, and Kernran, um, sorry, Larne and, and, uh, and Belfast. Do, do UK border force operate with any uh, force down uh, in the border uh, alongside the, the PSNI or, or any other agency? Um, as, as regards... Um, I want to come back to then, or the, 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 the diagram and the structure. Um, I suppose I'm struggling here just to give you a, a, a clear answer on this because I, I, I don't have the absolute definition. Yes, but, uh, border force um, do have authority within, um, you know, within Northern Ireland. We will, you know, we we work with them. Um, I don't deal directly with them, so I'm probably being cautious here in case I commit something to record. That's incorrect. If, if I put a bag so Steve, Steve's got the answer. So, sorry, I hope so. And um, sorry if I can help. Um, so, Border Force um, operates, you, you indicate, predominantly at airports and ports, but for um, border related criminality that's excise related. So, in other words, if it came through the airport or the port and it was tobacco importation or, or anything to do with excise or VAT fraud, that type of thing that they've, uh, they've uh, detected, they would refer it to us. So actually, most of the operations on the border involving that type of crime, we work actually with the PSNI very closely, NCA, and the Joint Agency Task Force, because it's normally cross-border. So the cross-border side of, of customs policing, for want of a better expression, is picked up by HMRC. And we have tried and tested protocols, enjoy fantastic support from the PSNI and other agencies, and, and, and uh, do a lot of that work. And, and it's... it's, it's, it's so if I can just jump in, that's, it's, it, but that's more reactive, I take it. That's more when they're needed, they go down. Um, there's no permanent presence down there alongside the police? No. So, if I, again, so we, we don't have a permanent presence, but it's not just, it's not just reactive. We'll also be uh, intelligence-led and develop investigations in conjunction with partners on the island of Ireland. But you, if your point is, I'll be there all the time, no, we're not. We go there when we need it. And Doug, I was just going to add in that if we are seeing intelligence that stuff is coming through the south of Ireland, uh, that is criminal commodity, we would rather take it out with our Angarda Shkona colleagues uh, through our international liaison officer network and have been quite successful this year in taking large amounts of drugs 
cash and various other things out, particularly in Dublin. Um, mm. To my view, that keeps Northern Ireland safer. Perfect. Thank you, Chair. Uh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, last but by no means least, Emma Rogan. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> Mine is really going to be a quick question, so don't be panicking. Um, it's, it's just around the, the, the part of the presentation or on, in the, the pack that we received about the criminal assets that are recovered and then they're returned to the enforcement law enforcement agencies. Then um, communities benefit from some of those assets. I know that within my own constituency, there's charities um, such as Life Changes Lives, and they have they have benefit from it. They then run restorative justice and diversionary, diversionary projects to help with reoffending or, or trying to take people away from reoffending. Um, when these funds are recovered and then they're directed back to our communities, how do you, how do we make sure as much as possible is spent in the communities and, and not on other projects um, you know we, we can see the benefits of the restorative justice and the diversionary the diversionary projects within communities and is there a potential to increase the amount of funding going to local charities and local communities from these assets yeah so I, I can certainly make a start on that one um, and others can keep me right on the technicalities of IRS versus ARCs um, so, but in, certainly in terms of ARCs, which is the bit of confiscation um, that comes um, directly to Northern Ireland and doesn't go to the agencies, um, there is a panel, there is an application process, um, and through that, typically seven, eight hundred thousand pounds a year goes out, um, almost exclusively actually to the community voluntary sector. Um, we actually were talking earlier about um, the, the other bit of that and whether in the longer term we could construct an argument that more of the money that is confiscated here doesn't go back to GB and actually it is available um, to Northern Ireland for that purpose. Um, I'm not sure if that's an answer, but yes, um, I think there may be a list of projects somewhere, and if not, I can certainly give you that. Okay, that's great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Linda Dillon just has a, a quick follow up. Thank you for, for all of your answers. I suppose just to, to highlight one of the issues that, that was raised there, just in relation to the intelligence-led stuff and, and concerns, obviously, that we would have around that. And my main concern is around the lack of accountability. It, it's the same concern, with the greatest respect, that we have around the NCA. There's no accountability. I mean, we have accountability mechanisms here for ps and We have account accountability mechanisms for the Justice Department through this committee, but we don't have accountability around whenever those um, human intelligence sources are used. You know, I, I, that's that's where my big concern is. There is no accountability. And Barbara, as as you know, and, and as we've been very vocal in, in making PSNA aware of, it actually damages confidence in the PSNA because I know, speaking from my own experience and my own constituency, that very often where drug dealers are not being picked up, and, and, and much of this is perception, not real, but perception is very important in, co in community confidence and policing, is that whenever they are not being arrested, that they're informers, and that's why they're not being arrested. And as long as, as it is the case that there is no accountability around these issues, that's always going to be something that is, is going to be a real issue for PSNA. It's a bigger issue for us here to be honest, than it is in other places because of our history. But that's, if you separate that out, it is an issue even around, around the drugs issue and, and, and separating all of the, the history out of it. It's an issue and, and it concerns me. So I'm just wondering, are there any ideas around how you could make that more accountable? I suppose if I start it, the crowd wants to come in here, but I suppose overall, and Linda, obviously you were on it, but the, the, the policing board is the accountable body um, for for us um, by all accounts, and there is um, an MOU in place with the NCA, and indeed the Director General uh, was um, well virtually present last week, um, it, both in private session and in public session around that. Um, but ultimately, there are like really strict legal frameworks in place uh, that NCA, that PSNI, that um, other agencies will be held you know, to account on against the legislative framework as regards any form of um, intelligence use or intelligence development. Um, 
and uh, you know that that is certainly a legal framework uh, that has been put in place um, very much to ensure that law enforcement bodies uh, particularly are um, accountable, that their actions are necessary, that they are proportionate uh, to everything that they're, they're doing. Um, I don't know, Craig, is there anything yeah. you want to add on that? I think it's, a, it's a really interesting point, and we do have accountability mechanisms that Barbara's described, and the Director General was at the board last week. Um, we also have recognised that we should be more visible to accountability mechanisms in Northern Ireland. Uh, as such, I was at the partnership committee of the policing board uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago now, uh, and also the, had a session with the police community safety partnerships that afternoon where we discussed what we do and how we do things. Uh, that will be an ongoing process. We've committed to doing that a couple of times a year uh, or at a time scale that meets the Northern Ireland Policing Board's uh, needs. Um, Barbara mentioned the, what we do under RIPA and the IPA. We are held very much to account and inspected on an annual basis. So there is a, a UK wide, so that's Scotland, Northern Ireland, Midland, and Wales, uh, understanding of how we use our, our uh, legislative capabilities. Um, but also that looks at our international use of a over human intelligence sources and other methods. So we are held very much to account. It may not feel like a Northern Ireland focus, but there is a, a focus on how we do our business. Um, but the important thing is we want to work more effectively in Northern Ireland and be held to account on that. We don't feel we've got anything to hide, things to keep uh, confidential, but nothing to hide in how we do our business. And we want to be held to account on that. Thank you. Okay, just f finally from me then, and then we will conclude this session. Obviously, part of the toolkit in trying to deter this is appropriate sentencing. And when I look at your report, and I note that of the fuel smuggling that took place from Europe via Dublin and Belfast, of the four people uh, that went to the PPS, only two were uh, prosecuted, both of which got suspended sentences. And then I look at the fuel laundering plant example that's cited in your report and the scale of that operation. And again, they got a prosecution with a six months suspended sentence, given the environmental crime that was also associated with that. How concerning is it to the task force that the sentencing um, is not acting as a deterrent to the criminals that are engaged in this type of activity? Um, <clears throat> so from a, an HNRC perspective, we've worked really hard with particularly the Northern Ireland Environment Agency to uh, focus on not just the criminality associated with fuel laundering and the danger to the public, but also the environmental impact. Um, I think we've slowly started to turn the tide, I think, in terms of sentencing. One of our difficulties is that um, often these uh, laundering plants and fuel laundering operations are um, in areas that are very difficult to maintain uh, observations for long periods of time. So actually when we do go um, and uh, um, identify and then dismantle these plants, in many instances we are uh, beholden to what we find on the day. One of the difficulties we have with fuel laundering and um, uh, uh, proving the worth of fuel laundering is that we can't say what happened to the plant the day before or the day before that, or the day before that, because we haven't been able to mount surveillance on it for a considerable period of time. Um, there are uh, many occasions where there is actually um, um, hired labour, for want of a better expression, and they can make that case, and we don't try to make a case different to that. Where we have made advances is that we've employed a significant forensic strategy um, with our own crime scene practitioner now, uh, employed by HMRC, um, and we've actually got two or three different hits at different laundering plants from DNA, which actually starts to build that pattern and make the uh, case to the courts that really, this is not just a one-off event, this is someone who's a controlling mind and a controlling influence. We've also referred five cases um, in the last two years through the Public Prosecution Service to examine, the director to examine unduly lenient sentencing. And that's something that PPS are alive to with us um, and against that background, I, I have to concur, I would like to see um, f uh, sentencing for fiscal offences um, um, commensurate, I think, to, to, the, to the amount that we can put before the courts. 
Um, so I would like to see it improved, um, but that is a matter for the court. So all we can do is keep presenting the case in the best way we can, looking at the asset portfolio um, and identifying the sort of the, uh, the chain of command. And then I'm afraid that is down to the courts from there, really. OK, well, I, I know there'll be a reluctance to start criticising judges. Um, that, that's always the case when it comes to criminal justice organisations. But I, I know that there will be frustration um, uh, from different people that I speak to across the different agencies around the sentences that are being administered. But it is something that uh, I'll certainly want to look at in the future, um, because we are looking at different uh, new sentencing framework for other types of offences. And if we need to improve legislation in respect of that, that's obviously something that uh, members of the Assembly might want to consider. So can I just conclude by thanking um, yourselves, Julie, Barbara, uh, Craig and Steve, particularly Steve, for coming over from Edinburgh to take part in this. Um, hopefully it's given you an opportunity to catch up with colleagues anyway, uh, as well as coming and speaking to us at the committee. Um, but thank you very much for the, the work uh, that you do in, in this very important area on behalf of the people of Northern Ireland. So thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. OK, members. There's some areas there that obviously people had asked for information on, and uh, we'll seek to follow that up um, where that information wasn't able to be provided, and, and we'll get that back to uh, committee members. Okay, members, we will move to the next item on the agenda. Item five is the Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill, the response from the Northern, Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, page 172173. Uh, and that is just to indicate that they have said that the committee's call for evidence on the Committal uh, Reform Bill, um, sorry, they had responded to our call for evidence and they had recommended the committee seeks further information from the department in respect of its analysis of the uh, Bill for Human Rights Compliance in terms of both the ECHR and international human rights law. The Commission notes that the Bill explanatory memorandum does not disclose any analysis, and as a matter of good practice, the Commission is of the view that a full analysis should um, have been provided to the Committee. So if members are content, we will write accordingly to the Department asking for that. Agreed. Agreed. And in, uh, six. Statutory rule um, this is in respect to the carriage of explosives regulations. The stat rule will correct Northern Ireland legislation uh, that would otherwise cease to function properly at the end of the EU exit transition period. Having considered information from the Department confirming that no gaps had been identified in the regulatory framework for the carriage of Class 1 dangerous goods, the Committee agreed at our meeting uh, on the 26th of November that it was content with the proposal for the stat rule. The examiner for stat rules has highlighted a minor drafting error in the rule that the Department has undertaken to fix that. The examiner is otherwise then content with the technical aspects of the rule, and the examiner's report is in your tabled pack. So if members are content with the statutory rule, I just need to formally put the question to members. Okay, that the Committee for Justice considered uh, the statutory rule, the carriage of explosives amendment, EU exit regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Members agreed? Agreed. Okay, members, um, that's been scheduled for uh, Monday in terms of the Assembly process for this, and I'll relay the Committee uh, response to it. Then item seven is the Police Re Rehabilitation and Retra uh, Retraining Trust. Um, and likewise, item 8 is connected in terms of the same issue, but the Department is proposing to make a statutory rule that would amend Section 6 of the Police Rehabilitation and Retraining Trust Regulations 2014 to enable the Board of the Trust to delegate any of its functions as it sees fit. This is required following a court judgment uh, against the Charity Commission in 2019, which found that its Board could not delegate decisions to its staff. Um, any public body which delegates functions to staff without an express power to do so in their founding legislation is operating ultra varies and should consider either changing their internal procedures to comply or amend their legislation to provide an express power of delegation to staff. The statutory rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure. So, members, um, it's just to indicate whether you're content with the proposed stat rule, if there's any further information. 
that's needed, Linda? Chair. Sure. Sorry. Yes, sorry, and then I think that was Sinead. I'm content with both, but could, could the department just let us know if there were of any other NDPBs that might be um, under the remit of DOJ that will need to make similar legislative change, but no problem with the actual stat rules content. Yeah, okay, Sinead? Yeah, similar point here. I was just keen to know whether the police re rehabilitation had come to the department or if this was the result of a scoping exercise and they're satisfied that this is the only NDPB that needs to take this action, I think it would be important to warn others who just may not be aware. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, sorry, Rachel. The only other, uh, um, I have no issue with either of them. Um, does this change any of the oversight or relationship between the department and the, and, uh, the bodies? In terms of reporting, is there is there anything sort of basically you know it, obviously there'll be procedures in place beforehand, but they would be maybe different now in terms of how they they report to the department. We we listen. We can ask that. My my, sure, my assumption is that it shouldn't because it, it it relates to the particular body and yeah. how it delegates out as opposed to how that body reports to the department. But that's listen. Let let's get the information. But. In terms of the, the principle behind what is being done, it's there's no further issues to be raised. Um, it's more, was this a scoping exercise? How did the organisations become aware? Did they ask it? And the reporting aspect to the department. So we can ask that information. It'll come back to the committee in terms of the actual That's statutory rules. That's need to lay with the actual yeah. statutory rules because it's not specific to those. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, listen, that's fine in terms of that one and let me just for formality just apply the same then this was um, around the Northern Ireland Police Fund regulations and again the department's proposing to make the statutory rule amending section 6 of the Northern Ireland Police Fund regulations that uh, 2016 which would enable the board of the fund to delegate any of its functions as it sees fit for the reasons outlined in relation to the previous proposed statutory rule and again it's by way of the same negative resolution procedure so we'll take it that the previous comments apply to both items on the agenda okay correspondence there's nine items of correspondence um at pages 212 to 323 of your meeting pack and then there's one item at page 12 to 122 of the table pack and then there's been also another item uh, just tabled in hard copy this afternoon and I'll draw attention to a couple of the items. Uh, one of them is just item 7 and it's on the correspondence sheet. It was an email uh, that was received from Maria Cahill requesting an update regarding an inquiry a previous committee had considered undertaking in 2014. It's just uh, members to seek your agreement uh, that uh, the committee would advise Ms Cahill that items that are on previous committee work programmes um, are not carried over at the end of a mandate and they're not automatically considered by a newly established uh, committee. Um, and also, uh, by way of the current accurate position, the committee has agreed uh, that because of the legislative time frame that there isn't scope to carry out other inquiries. Um, and that would be representative of the, the factual position around the workload for the rest of this mandate and if members are content then that will be communicated as such. Item 9 uh, is a report of a follow-up review from the Northern Ireland Audit Office on managing children who offend which was published on the 1st of December. Um, while acknowledging the progress has been made since 2017, the report does highlight a number of issues including the lack of a specific strategy to coordinate the youth justice system as well as deficiencies around measuring the performance and cost of uh, effectiveness of services. So the Public Accounts Committee may wish to report, um, may wish to consider this report further. It is currently deciding its priorities in January and if it decides not to hold an inquiry into the report, then this committee can follow up as proposed in the correspondence sheet and the clerk will be liaising with the Public Accounts Committee clerk um, and updating the committee then in due course on this area, it is the PAC that first takes priority. We then we deal with it subject to what they do. Linda? No, and that's okay. I, I just would like that we write to the department and ask them um, to tell us how they plan to implement the recommendations because this is one of the issues, not specifically just around this issue, but um, 
it's one of the reasons that we find ourselves in the position we find ourselves over the amendment that, that wasn't agreed with the department is because of that, I suppose, unwillingness for different sectors to believe that when recommendations are brought forward that they'll actually be carried um, through. And I think that we as a committee have a responsibility there, and I'm not sure that that's always been carried out. I think we need to remember we are only a 20-year-old assembly. I think people forget that, and for a number of those years, family wasn't sitting, and there was all sorts of complications. And we're probably only at a point now where we're where we're doing this and doing it effectively and well. And I think we'll do it much much better going forward. We or somebody else, depending on the results of any election. But but I do think that the, that we will do it much better going forward. I think that's what we need to start doing. It was something that when I was on the policing board, it was the first thing, one of the first things I did whenever I, when I found my feet. Um, was make a suggestion in my committee that we look at all outstanding reports. We bring forward a, a table which showed what the recommendations from those reports were, what ones had been implemented, what ones hadn't, and what ones weren't going to be, and why. Because what we will do is ask for, you know, get do, do a report, get recommendations. Three or four years later, we're asking the same organisation to do the same report to get the same recommendations to again not get them implemented. We we'll really need to start drilling down on where there are recommendations before we ask for another report to be done that either all recommendations are implemented or reasons for not implementing them. So that if you ask for another report in four years, you say it to those that are doing the report, you can make that recommendation. We can try to bottom it out again, but here were the reasons we were given the last time why it wasn't implemented. So can you have maybe a conversation with that organisation as to whether it's ever going to be possible to implement it? enough has changed for it to be implemented because doing the same reports getting the same recommendations on all these issues is absolutely pointless I know there's a couple of members who are going to bring in I am just going to ask Christine to address the issue because of the nature of the PAC and the, the linkages to that as to what the normal protocols are Okay, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, Northern Ireland Audit Office reports uh, PAC has primacy over them so um, a statutory committee does not get involved in it until such times as either PAC carry out their inquiry and call the department up and do the report, mm -hmm. or they decide they're not going to, which is um, why the PAC clerk, when she spoke to me, they're going to decide their priorities at the beginning of January. Um, so I will liaise with her and we will know at the beginning of January whether they are going to follow up on it, in which case they will call officials up along with um, to answer the PAC, mm -hmm. they'll produce a report and they'll expect the written response back, so they'll do an inquiry into it. If not, then it's open to this committee to follow up in whatever way you want. But we do need to wait until PAC decide no, that's, what, that's what their enough. action is. Just in general, I think it's something that we should be doing moving forward. Sure. I think everybody has the same frustration. I'm quite sure even staff in the department and staff in this committee have the same frustration when they see the same things coming back. And, and we just need to start being more focused on recommendations and either addressing them or admitting we can't. Okay, Rachel. Um, thanks, Chair. And it was just with regard to this. Obviously, there's quite a bit of mention, even just in the media release, about woodlands. And I know we were due to have a session with Kula, the Children's Commissioner, mm -hmm. with regard to the Trust and Department of Justice's consultation out for woodlands. Um, so. Has that been scheduled, or does that need to be scheduled then after? We're looking to schedule it in the new year, okay. so we'll be in contact with her to try and organise a suitable date that, that suits, but it's Brilliant. on the list to be scheduled. So but that wouldn't stop. The, if the PAC decide to take this forward, we can still no, no, have no. that conversation with Kula and, and have a look at the consultation? Yes. Uh -huh. no, that's a separate issue. It's just this specific report belongs within the PAC remit until yeah. they decide they're not going to follow up on it, but that's a separate one, and that briefing will go ahead. Oh, definitely. It's just that it is Woodlands, obviously, is is, is very key to this, and, and it says, you know, about reoffending rates and investment and fundamental elements of transformation, but there is a consultation ongoing at the moment on yeah. transformation of Woodlands, which would have repercussions to the outcomes of this report. Yeah, um, so but I think what we're asking for is, I think what the committee asked for was a briefing from the Children's Commissioner on that particular consultation and other justice related issues for children so it's much wider than, than that that's fine thank you
Paul? Yeah, just on the point the Linda makes, which is a very good point, uh, I think we need complete scrutiny and we will get better as we go along and progress and evolve. And hopefully all committees will get to a degree of standard that's acceptable and, and efficient. But uh, when you are scrutinising reports, it's up to the department to give you the information that you require. Because I can remember my experience on the Agriculture Committee when I was chair, whereby they brought a report and the recommendations in a green, uh, green, amber, red traffic light system. And they thought, of course, we were going to target the red that hadn't been completed yet. But when we scrutinised the green, it was found that none of those were actually implemented. So they actually had misinformed the committee with regards to the, what had been adopted and implemented and what had not. So again, that's, that's a trait that we'll have to learn also. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. It, we have to, but I think if we just have it all sitting there in front of us, it, act, it at least leaves it a wee bit easier than, than trying to... I appreciate this is work for officials, but yep. it'll less in the work in the future. Okay. Any help? Okay. Um, the next item just then was the Sijini report on an inspection of the probation board. It makes um, five strategic and six oper operational recommendations. It covers a range of areas, including improving how risk of harm to others is assessed and managed improving information sharing arrangements, addressing culture and trust issues within the organisation and reviewing the board's status and governance arrangements. So if members are content, we'll write and ask the department for a written response in the first case um, in terms of this report, because <coughs> it does raise a number of issues that um, <coughs> I think could be a cause of concern, but let's get a written response from the department and the probation board to the report. And then we'll decide um, should we schedule a, an oral briefing session thereafter or any other actions. Correspondence then um, that the Minister has tabled just this afternoon. It provides an update on the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service in terms of a Nightingale Court project. Um, and it's there, members, for noting. Obviously, we haven't had much time to do it. Um, but it indicates how um, there is an advanced stage whereby. Uh, the International Convention Centre, I think it's at the waterfront, um, will be used to uh, provide additional capacity within the court system. Um, I always thought Nightingale was referred to a health aspect, but I, I get I get the, the concept of what's trying to be conveyed in that, um, because of the pressures on the court system as a result of the, the past seven months and the need to try and uh, move things forward at a much quicker pace, so uh, I'll welcome anything that's going to help speed up the court system getting back in action again and, and clearing the significant backlog which has now been created. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, just, Linda. Just, it's not directly connected, but it is a wee bit. I was wondering maybe if, if yourself and myself should arrange a meeting with the Lord Chief Justice. There's a number of issues that have come up in recent times that will probably be relevant. Um, not least the the bill that we're currently <laughs> scrutinising, yeah. um, and a number of bills that we will be. So I, I would like maybe to, to raise some of those issues with the Lord Chief Justice if, if we could arrange a meeting. And I think that we could, if we were doing that, we could put it out to members that if they have issues, specific issues they want us to raise, Doesn't it? that we could do that in the first instance. Um, yes, and and. I would have liked to have had the Lord Chief Justice before the committee mm -hmm. by now, but obviously circumstances haven't been able to facilitate that because that is something that you know would have happened. Um, um, so let, let's explore if we can have a meeting. Um, I'd be happy to do that and to have that discussions with them. Um, my preference would be to have them to come to the committee for everyone's benefit, but let 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 open up the conversations with the Yeah, I'm, you know. I'm not precious either way. It's whichever can be done more quickly just to ha get a conversation with them yeah. around some of the issues. Okay. There's no other items on the correspondence. If members are content then to action them as outlined in the cover sheet. Content. Okay. I don't have... Uh, Sinead, your hand is up. I don't have it on my computer screen. Earlier. Maybe just from earlier. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Chairman's um, business. Then uh, there's a a written briefing paper was sent from the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists on Justice 
and speech and language and communication issues, and it's in the tabled pack. And if any members would uh, wish to meet informally with representatives of the organisation, please feel free to let Christine know, and the committee staff will help facilitate that. Um, on any other business, the Minister uh, has written advising uh, that she is seeking the approval of the Executive for the Protection from Stalking Bill and has provided advance copies of the bill and explanatory memorandum for the committee. And the papers will uh, formally go into the pack for next week's meeting. And in the meantime, the committee office can provide a copy if any member would wish to have it today. Rachel? Yes, Chair. Thank you. I would. You would? Yeah. So I just wanted to let people know that we had got that. Um, I, I trust it goes through the executive in due course, but it's there. It's coming. How can we get it today? Pardon? Is it, will it be by email if we get it today? Christine, would that be by email or by hard copy? You have it, Christine, yes? Yes, we have it. We can email it out. Yeah. It's just it's quite hefty. Yeah. But I don't mean it's quite hefty, but yeah. no, we can email it out well, that's good. and then we'll put it in the pack for next week. We'll just email it out to all members. It's a wee bit of time to leave the weekend. And there was one other issue under any other business I was going to raise, or Paul, Paul maybe was going to raise it. Um, recently we met with a family that had been associated with the O'Hara inquiry into hyponatremia. Um, and I, I just wanted to, I know primarily in health and the health committee have been getting updates from the Department of Health on this, um, but there's an aspect of those recommendations um, that may have a justice role. And I was going to ask if the committee would agree that we could write to the department asking, was there any of those recommendations that fell to the Department of Justice to consider. Um, I think the specific one is around this duty of candour aspect um, and speaking to, to that family, but there may be other recommendations and it's just to get a steer from the Department of Justice. Have they been engaged in this and is there any anything that we as a committee could be made aware of in respect of that, if you're agreeable? Yes. Okay, then uh, we're due to meet um, next Thursday the 17th at 2 o'clock and that will be in room 30. So thank you members. Meeting adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.